Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale radio controlled early production Armor Tech Tiger 1. Since the last video update, a lot of progress has been made to the tank's turret detailing and the model in this video here is basically ready for painting. We'll be going over these additions and modifications in this video. And starting off this video, we're diving right in with the kit components that are supplied with the kit for the early pattern drum cupola and the loader's hatch. Now, like I said before, the Tiger 131 kit from Armor Tech is the first time since 2005 an early production Tiger was made. And that kit was basically an improved version of their mid-production unit. The reason why I say this is because several of the components on the table here are very similar, if not identical, from the first production unit. And some of the other components are heavily modified and updated to keep up with Armor Tech's current tooling. Now starting from the left and working our way to the right takes us to first the loader's hatch. The loader's hatch that is supplied with the kit are comprised of these two main pieces here. We have the mounting frame which gets bolted to the exterior portion of the Tiger 1 roof and then we have the actual hatch itself. Now on the original Armor Tech kit releases. These here would have been made from a cast white metal alloy. And when Armor Tech switched over to CNC aluminum, the piece was changed to the design that we have here. The pieces themselves overall have the correct visual appearance to them and scale, of course. They are fully functional and assemble very easily. There's two supply pins which get mounted in these two locations here and there's also a pre-bent aluminum handle which facilitates the opening and closing of the hatch. Now exterior wise like I said the hatch is pretty good from what it gives you. The one area which does need to be addressed by me is the interior portion or I should say lack thereof. Just like with the other hatches that were mentioned in the last video with the escape hatch and also with the with the bow hatches in a video two that came earlier before that, the stock loader's hatch is just a clean piece of aluminum machining. Although it is kind of cool, you can see the little maze pattern that the tool went ahead and went in order to square this piece off. Now, of course, more information on this is to be discussed as the video progresses. So for now, I'll set that aside. This now brings us to the main event, which is the tank's commander's drum cupola. Now the drum cupola is comprised of these components that we have here. Starting from the right and our working our way to the left brings us to the main drum itself. Here you can see the drum. It's actually two CNC aluminum turnings. They have their periscope vision slits pre-machined in. They also have the correct type of pattern when it comes with the Way the piece is turned we have this little belt around the bottom and a thinner section on the top and we have the pre-tapped fastener mounting holes for the top plate which I'll go over in a second one nice feature that this unit has is that armor tech added the little drainage holes which are found on the top rim of the commander's cupola this is always a feature that I typically have to add on my earlier build. So that's a nice addition that they made. Now the turnings are, themselves are actually very similar to the ones found on the earlier production units. In fact, I would be hard pressed to think that these were basically identical and backwards compatible. The only difference that I see, can see between these two bits of detailing are the addition of the drainage holes. It's one of those things that Armatech basically got right on the first try when they did their version all those years ago. Setting the main drum aside for the time being now takes us to the drums lid. The lid is comprised of this single piece of aluminum and is again CNC'd and if we notice has its little built up ridge area present on this turning. Now this is one change that was made from the earlier units. On the earlier Armor Tech kits this piece here would have been a laser cut steel disc and the elevated section here was not present. In fact, it was you were basically on the hook to fabricate this piece and it was just not included with the older sets. When Armortech of course switched to CNC tooling when they re-released 
their early production Tiger. This is one of the additions that they made to change it. Now I'm pretty sure if you have one of the older units, this piece here looks to be a interchangeable part and you can just basically swap it on to your older kit if you're either rebuilding one or I guess, you know, counter one in the wild and you want to give it a facelift. The unit, as you see, just drops directly in place. There's no hand fitting and needs to be done whatsoever, and the holes line up absolutely perfectly. With the lid out of the way, this now brings us to the hatch. The hatch, again, is actually almost identical to the ones found on the first pattern of Armor Tech kits, and is comprised of a single turning of CNC'd aluminum. Now, as one can see, not only is this piece very basic with the exterior face of it, which, again, is just a flat plate, but the interior face is also very basic as well. The hatch will be going over some reworking processes in order to improve it from its stock format to really bring it up to the next level. Now that brings us to the hinge mechanism. Now one thing that's unique about the early production Tiger 1 is that the hinge for the hatch was this weird floating spring assisted type design. And the Armor Tech kit really reproduce it in very nice detailing. Starting with the main hinge blocks themselves, these pieces are CNC'd out of aluminum. Now on the original releases, these would have been very similar in size and spec, but they would have been machined of CNC brass. Just like with the old units, the new units here are actually very nicely done. They have their correct shape to them and actually function in a very similar way to the real unit. From here it takes us to the two linking blocks. These two ovular type pieces are what connect the hatch to the receptacle hatch hinge found on the top portion of the cupola. Again, nicely machine made and on the originals these would have been brass. But again, I don't see any issues with the assembly of these and they look to assemble in a very quick manner. This now brings us to the center portion. This little guy here gets mounted to the center of the hatch and is what will actually pivot inside of this little dog leg hinge that we have here. Now the dog leg itself is made of laser cut steel and has its cutouts already present. I don't see any real modification that needs to be made to this piece with the exception of adding the detailing for the ex for the counterbalance springs which will be again discussed once the detailing is complete on this set. Now after looking at the kit supplied hatch I determined that rather than trying to modify it and redetail it to improve its surface detailing, it was easier for me to just replace it all together with the unit that I have here. This hatch here is the resin set from EastCoastArmory.com. Now this hatch here is intended specifically for the early production Tiger. The hatch designs between the early Tiger and late Tiger did differ quite a bit from each other. Now I do go into more detail on the differences between the two, but that is something that I talk about in more depth in a late production Armor Tech Tiger 1 video that I did a little while ago. However, the set that we have here is all resin and is fully detailed on both the exterior and the interior detailing. Now all the components that you see here are supplied with the ECA set and were simply assembled out of the box. Now from here the unit is going to go into its painting procedure and then it's going to be mounted to the roof of the turret. Now for the cupola reworking I'm going to need to address some of the detailing that needs to be done to the top hatch itself. Now rather than trying to rework and upgrade and modify the stock Armor Tech hatch, I'm going to simply swap it out with one of my resin hatches that are supplied with the ECA drum cupola kit. The hatches are basically the, the same size, so the transition between the two should be relatively easy for me to undertake. What I do need to do is I need to mill away the hinge section over here and replace it with the Armor Tech kit hinge so that the piece will still function as per the original kit's design, but with the new replacement hatch. As you can see, the ECA hatch has all the surface detailing found on the exterior, as well as also on the interior portion of the hatch, as opposed to the ArmorTech one, which is again just a basic plate of CNC aluminum. 
And here's the same patch now going through its modifications. You'll notice that on this scene here, the Armortech kit supplied hinge mechanisms have been mounted to the Resin ECA unit. Now to mount them, this was done with basically the same assembly technique which is used on the stock kit hatch, which is the use of fasteners. If I flip the hatch upside down, you'll see the locations where the new fasteners were added. Now, of course, these are going to be plugged up now with the bodywork, now that the parts are permanently mounted. Once the bodywork is added and everything is sanded flush, the piece will have a seamless look, and the component can then go into its next step. Now, like I showcased before, the stock Armortech Cupola set does not include the interior detailing. Now, for the interior detailing, I have these components that we have here on the table. These parts here are lifted from the ECA German Tiger One Cupola set. They consist of the periscopes and also the padded headrests. Now both the headrests and the periscopes are casted in my standard resin. However, one change that I made to the kits has to do with the little headrests that we have here on the periscopes themselves. In the past, these pieces would have been made from standard resin, which do do the job. However, I decided to swap them out in recent years with these new versions here, which are made in cast rubber. The cast rubber pieces are a little bit more realistic with just their basic material. The rubber gives a more realistic effect as opposed to just trying to paint them with weathering and other painting techniques. Now, like I said before, the new cast rubber head and chin rests are supplied with the current edition of the ECA early drum cupola sets. However, if anyone has some of the older editions that have been casted throughout the years, the ones that have the solid resin head and chin rests and want to level up, this is definitely something that can be arranged by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. And here we have the cupola's interior detailing now fitted to the rings themselves. Now the cupola rings themselves are left untouched from the stock Armor Tech kit. They were simply just mounted together as they are designed to be done on the model. On the inside, the components that I mentioned before have now been or fitted to their appropriate locations. Of course, wherever there's a direct vision slit on the exterior, you will have an interior detailing of the periscope insert. In between the two, are the little headrests that I also mentioned before. With the interior detailing out of the way, I can now focus on the roof as well as the cupola hatch. And here we have the hatch now fully completed, painted, weathered, and is ready for installation. You can see that the bodywork has been completed since the last scene. The holes which were used for mounting of the external components are now thoroughly blended away. Makes for a nice seamless look and the weathering is now added to all of the components. On the outside here we have the armor tech hinge which was successfully mated and blended into the ECA hatches detailing. Here you can see how the two pieces join and there's a small little step on this section over here which was sculpted with the bodywork and this little component is found on the real Tiger 1 hatch and by combining the two gives a lot better accuracy compared to just having the piece just stand alone. From here the part will be mounted to the cupola and then I could just go ahead and add the final touches to it. One of the last and probably one of the biggest detail components found on the Tiger Tart to now mention is the rear bustle storage bin. Now the unit that we have here is the stock armor tech unit and it's comprised of the pieces that you see on the table mostly. For the main body we have a sheet metal tube that has been bent to shape and welded along its center spine seam. There's a bottom plate and a top plate which are both made from CNC aluminum alloy. Then there are two laser cut steel plates for the use of hatches. Now the only thing not showcased on this scene right here are the little brass hinges which are used to bolt to these sections here, thus giving you the completed bin detailing. Now design-wise, the bin itself has the overall basic shape and look of the Tiger One bin. Now when it comes to Tiger One bins, of course, if anyone's a fan of my videos, you'll know that there have been several iterations of these things that were developed since the Tiger One was first 
put on scene. However, the bin that we have here was really the finalized bin and is the one that the Tiger One had throughout the majority of its life. Also to point out that when it comes for Armor Tech kits, this design here is almost identical to the ones that have been found on the first and earlier generation of Armor Tech kits. And I have an example of one, which is right over here. Here you can see the two units. This one here is from the first generation release, which was around 2004 or five time, time frame. And you can see the design of which is basically identical to the current offering. The only difference is that the top and bottom and bottom portions, rather than being CNC aluminum, are made from that white metal cast alloy, which was more common on the older generation kits. However, the part layout is almost identical, and I would be hard pressed to see if you can't even intermix the components together. Now, the bin itself is not going to be utilized on this build. Now, like I said before, the piece itself has the basic overall shape, size, and dimensions to the bin found on the Tiger One. However, in order to clean it up and to bring it up to the next level of detailing, it can be done, but it will take a little bit of work. So rather than going this route, I went ahead and actually developed a brand new replacement piece, and that piece I have right over here. Now, if, if anyone is a fan of the ECA channel on Facebook, you'll notice that I've posted samples of this unit when I first completed it. And here, I finally have the actual part now in hand. The new bin that we have here is all comprised of 3D printing. This entire unit is one integral printing which of course streamlines production and it also streamlines the amount of work that needs to go into this piece in order to complete it. You'll also see the detailing that is found on this piece. We have here all of the riveting. And believe it or not, I actually painstakingly counted the rivets on the Bovington 131 Tiger One on the photographs that I found, ensuring that I get the right amount of rivets found on this piece. This is also true for the top portion as well. You can see the riveting added to the tops and even on the little inlet that we have here. Now, if you notice, one big difference between the ECA one and the ArmorTech unit is that the ArmorTech unit, because of the, the material this is made in with the sheet metal, the channel goes all the way down through and through the piece. However, on the Tiger One's bin, it's actually only in this little section over here, and the purpose of this cutout is to make clearance for the turret lifting lug, which is found on the back portion of the Tiger One's turret. I also, of course, did the other components, and those are found on this runner that we have over here. Here we have the actual hatches, as well as their hinges, and even the little locking latches, which are found on the, on the face here of the bin itself. Which, by the way, I can tell you for a fact, trying to fabricate these little pieces does get pretty difficult as you go on with these builds. But here you can see it's no longer a case because these were now all found on this printing. Now, in addition to the exterior detailing, I also did the interior detailing of the hatches, which you can see here with this inner gutter. And on the real unit, there would be a rubber gasket, which would be found in this little space over here. And that would lock onto this little ridge that we have here on the outer portion of the bin. When everything is locked and sealed in place, this of course prevents any moisture from getting inside of the bin, thus getting any of the bags or other equipment which can be kept in this device here from getting spoiled from the elements. Now in addition to the other detailing, you can also see how the hinge work protrudes from the top plate. And again, this is as per the real unit that I was studying. We also have here the other rivets found on the side plates. Again, the very signature bit of detailing on these Tiger One bins. Now to secure to the model, I'm actually going to be recycling the straps which were supplied with the Armor Tech kit in order to secure the kit one to the rear portion of the turret. You can see here these two sections where there's these sections are drilled and tapped. On the stock Armor Tech kit there are these two pieces of laser cut and bent steel plates and these are going to be recycled on the ECA unit and get mounted in these little sections over here where if you notice there's a gap in the riveting. There are also two other straps on the bottom that again are supplied with the Armor Tech kit and those are going to be recycled as well. Now not showcased on the table are the other bits that are included with this set which would be the little bits of metal fasteners in order to pin together all the hinge work. Of course I'll be going over this aspect once the bin progresses from this point here and moves towards completion and installation. 
Now this unit here is a new addition to the East Coast Armory.com product line and will be able to work on not just the Armortech Tiger One family, but also all of the other 1-6 scale Tiger Ones that have been released on the market. From the Field of Armor, to the radar controlled fiberglass models from Eastern Europe, to even anyone who's scratch building a Tiger One. Now here's a little behind the scenes action. Here we have the bin going through its production phase. If you notice, one lid has already been assembled and the latches are fully functional. Now in order to assemble the other side, let me go through the procedures on video. Okay, first what you're gonna do, you're gonna add the padlock loops to these two little sections over here. On the complete units, you could see what they look like once mounted. And like I said before, these are, on the real unit, used to secure padlocks, which keep everything secured in place. Now the holes have already been dremeled out and the wire is just going to be bent into the shape of small little U's and then just affixed to the piece. Just with a small little plier. I bend wire into the shape of a small U and I'll repeat this step. Now you don't want to have them too long because you don't want to have them overextend into the inside portion but with the thickness of the part something like this should be more than suffice. Only thing needed to help keep them in place is just a, two tiny little drops of super glue. Once added, with the help of a good plier, you just line up the holes and insert and line them up to where they need to be. Just do the exact same thing to the last one. Now that the lock loops are done, we can now go ahead and get the hatch and the latches ready. Now for the removal of the components off of the, the hatch, you'll be utilizing a clean cut snip like I have here and just a regular X-Acto type knife. The material is very forgiving. You just snip off the pieces of nylon and the little nubs that are remained can be just cleaned away with the X-Acto knife. Once polished away, you can then also remove the other little bits that we have on here. Now you don't want to lose these as of course you're not going to be able to put it, put it together if the pieces are misplaced. like with before, to remove any of the, ex the excess stem, just a knife is really all you need. Now this material does cut very well with a knife. You can also file it, however filing may be a little bit problematic due to the nylon material. From what I've seen, the best experience is with just a regular knife. Just go over the surface and remove any sort of lump that will still be remaining off of the removed bit. Now that that's all removed, I can put the door in place. And by the way, the doors are left and right hand specific. So if you're assembling this unit and you are trying to install the door and it's just not fitting right, do not try to alter the hinge work in any way, shape or form because that hatch is for the opposite side. And of course, this is vice versa as well. Now, just like with the main door itself, on the latches, you still have a little bit of runner stem to remove. And this is necessary in order to get the pieces to function properly. And with the clean cut snip, I just remove the extra material, which is no different than working on, say, any other plastic model. With the bit removed, Again, with the X-Acto knife, just go ahead and just whittle away at the little remaining stem that's left in order just to smooth it out. You don't need to go overboard, just enough until you're suffice with the shape of the piece. Now you don't have to worry about the piece snapping on you, as you notice the piece is very flexible, which is good, it's not brittle, which will come into handy when it comes time for the installation. 
Same can also be said to the actual latch itself. Just a little bit of material is all that needs to be removed that remains from the other piece. Now this is why I recommend a clean cut snip for this. You can of course use a standard wire cutter, but this will leave a little bit more clean up compared to the clean cut snip that I have here. And if anyone is a person who builds plastic models, one of these should be in your, in your toolbox. If not, I highly recommend acquiring one. Okay, now that the material is removed, it's now time for the sub-assembly. The kit is supplied with these small little pins that I have here. And these pins are going to be utilized to hinge these pieces together. And then two more pieces of metal are going to be used to hinge them to the actual side of the bin. Now, if you notice on the piece itself, there are two holes that are integrally printed, as well as there's a hole integrally printed into the latch itself. No dremeling of any sort is required, and the holes are present on the raw printings. Now, the way these line up is that the latch itself actually goes on the second hole here, towards the bottom. You just line it up, and with the pin, you just slide it directly through. Now, because of the size of the hole, it might take one or two attempts, but everything should just line right up. And again, this is where the flexibility of the piece does come into handy. Up oh, there we go. Once the piece is slid in, a little drop of super glue on the stem of the pin. Slide it all the way in. And then with the regular wire cutter, you snip the excess pin away. Now, I use the wire cutter for this because the clean cut snip can do this, but you will end up damaging a clean cut snip when it comes time to cutting something hard like metal. So, you want to just avoid from doing that. Once this is done, you do the exact same thing to the other unit. Again, you line it up to the bottom set of holes. Now, if you make a mistake, it's no big deal. You just remove the pins and you allocate to the appropriate hole desired. Go. Drop a glue. Slide it in. And snip this guy away. And there we go. The latches now are ready for installation. Okay, now to install the latches to the piece, again, orientation is going to be key. The way these are orientated is that this little hole here is going to go onto these little lugs. And you want to have the latch in this position that you see here with the bend portion pointing up. With the bend portion pointing up, this is going to properly index to the receptacle latch found on the lid itself. Again, you just line everything up with the pin. You just insert it where it needs to go. And we're done. Again, a little drop of glue just to keep everything where it needs to be. I could clip this guy away. And we're done with this one. Now for the super glue, I'm using my usual slow dry Great Plain CA, which is the brand that I recommend, and it's the one I use for basically all my builds. You don't want to use anything super fast because when it comes time for getting everything seated in place, the super fast drying stuff can be a problem because the piece could dry part way through, and you really don't want to deal with that. And of course, last but not least, is the main lid itself. Now for the lid, I'll be utilizing these wire brads which just slide directly into place. A little coercion with a plier can help. The holes do line up, but it's just a little bit stiff with the material, which is, believe it or not, what you want. You don't want to have these things flopping around on you. As you can see now, the bin is fully completed. The functionality of the piece is nice and solid, and the latch can slip directly into where it needs to go and then lock into place. A little tricky, but oh, there's one and there's the other. Okay, well, here's the bin now fully assembled and ready to go into its next step. Here you can see that the assembly went by very quickly and also very effortlessly. 
the unit probably took longer to film the assembly than to actually just do it off screen. Now that the unit is fully assembled, I could go ahead and mount on the stock Armortech mounting straps, which go on the top and on the bottom portion. And after that, the unit will head off into paint. Now, because the unit is 3D printed, printing grain is going to be on some of the surfaces. Now, most of the surfaces look like the side that we have over here, where the grain is not really an issue. And after a few coats of primer and even the base coat, this should be more than enough to smooth out the surface and make the grain completely invisible. This is also true for the top and for the bottom, which is not really a concern. On this bin here, I noticed that there was a little bit of grain found on the face here of the, the bin. Now, one thing about removing grain off of this material is that unlike traditional mediums where you would just hit it with some sandpaper before it goes into paint, with the type of nylon that this unit is printed in, it's actually abrasive resistant, and if you try hitting it with the sandpaper, it's not really gonna do a whole lot. From my experience with working with this type of material is that the best way to contend with the grain is you first coat it with a few coats of primer like I did over here. Once the primer is thoroughly dry, at that point you could then hit it with the sandpaper or in this case I even used a palm sander to speed up the process. Once the palm sander and the hand sanding is done, the unit will be nice and smooth and from here I can then add some more coats of primer which will then make the rest of the surface completely smooth and the grain is completely invisible. And here's the bin now mounted to the model. You can see, like I said before, after the sanding and the coats of primer, the surface is completely smooth and any traces of the scan lines are totally removed. Also, you'll notice that the pins have been trimmed from the last scene. This was of course done after the unit was painted. And when I was priming the unit, this was done with the lids off so that it makes painting and priming the parts a little bit easier. The bin is still fully functional. From the functional lid, takes us to the mounting straps. Now these are the two straps that I mentioned before that are the kit supplied ones. And notice that they are bolted to the bin via two brass fasteners. And they are connected to the turret via these two hex bolts that we have here. Now the turret does have these sections that are pre-drilled and tapped, and I just went back into those holes. Now moving lower, you'll see the other two straps that are used to keep the bin in place. These two are laser cut and bent pieces of steel that are mounted to the vehicle via two large Allen bolts. They are very, very strong and do a great job and keep everything in place. Now the bin is actually designed to be removable. This is actually very important specifically on one of these armor techs. Because of the weight of the turret and because the tank is radio controlled, you are going to need to get access to the vehicle from time to time. If the bin was affixed to the model permanently, this is going to make removal of the target quite difficult as the piece Although it's very strong, it's still a little bit on the cumbersome end and a little bit fragile in trying to pick the tank up through this location over here. In fact, the best way I've learned to pick up these Armortech Tiger 1 turrets is one hand cradles underneath the gun over here, and the other hand can wrap around the lift lug that's found in the back. In order to do this, the bin first needs to be removed. Now this is a feature that I built into my last Tiger 1, actually my last two 160L Armortech Tiger 1s, and the system does work pretty well. In order to remove the bin, this is facilitated by these two bolts that we have here and here. You just remove these bolts and the entire bin just slides directly off. Those two straps that I mentioned before are permanently affixed to the tank's turret and do not get removed, and again, are there just to hold everything in place. Now, oddly enough, this system is very similar to the way it's done on the real vehicle for, again, the exact same reasons. Now before I go ahead and finish off the roof detailing for this model, I went ahead and popped the roof off in order to focus back on the inner portion of the mantlet. Like I said in a video or two that came earlier, this model here does have a POV camera fitted inside of the mantlet. I went ahead and made some modifications to the Armor Tech kit in order to facilitate this function. Since the last video, the camera has been mounted, and you can see that the camera was inserted into its mantlet cavity. The unit is held in place with silicone, which again 
acts as a temporary bond, but is strong enough to keep everything firmly in place, but weak enough so in case I need to get access to it, I could just remove the material without any causing any permanent damage to the model or to the camera equipment itself. The other equipment, the camera equipment is mounted again on the inside portion here of the turret casing and is just tucked away in the corner to prevent it from getting in the way. The wiring here will be patched into the circuitry that is found inside of the tank's hull that I mentioned in an earlier video. However, even though it's not patched into the tank circuitry, I can at least test it in this configuration here. Here I have the battery from the hull that's used to power the two camera system. Now here I have the camera now turned on. If I could get into focus, you can actually see what the unit sees. Now, it, this is, of course, out of the gunner scope. And you can see my hand, hopefully this comes out in video. It's a little bit hard to videotape these LCD screens, but you can see with the gunner scope, we'll see when the tank is driving around. Now, I do need to mount on a switch in order to switch between the turret camera and the bow driver's camera so you can drive the model with either camera being used. Now one of the last bits of detailing that need to be added to the turret to get it finished are the smoke grenade launchers. Now when it came to the time for the smoke grenade launchers I kind of just went ahead and started installing them and assembling them and I didn't get a chance to get them photographed in their raw form on the table here. However, basically in a nutshell, the kit supplies you with a very generic set of Tiger One smoke grenade launchers. They are comprised of primarily of sheet metal components. We would have here a sheet metal bracket that would be pre-drilled, a sheet metal bracket that holds up the canisters, and the canisters themselves would be made from turned steel cylinders. Now, the detail units that are supplied with the set again are very basic and can be improved with some fiddling and scratch filling however it will not be utilized on this model instead in their place i'll be utilizing the set that i have here which is from panzer technic now if anyone's a fan of the last early tiger one build video that i've series that i've done there i mentioned there was a set from a company called panzer technic which had a upgrade detail set for the smoke grenade launchers and that's the set that we have here. The Panzer Technic ones are very very nicely detailed and come assembled out of the box. Now this set here I actually have I found it in a stash that I that I was digging through and so rather than trying to modify the kit one or even using one of my resin ones I just threw the Panzer Technic set on. Now I don't believe Panzer Technic is still in business their website still appears to be up, but I'm not sure if they're still accepting orders. So that's something, if you're interested, it's best by contacting the individual who owns that website. Anyway, the unit is very nice detail, like I said. It comes pre-wired and pre-assembled and is basically ready for installation out of the box. Now, the bracket that we have here is not the original bracket that came with the ArmorTech model. That unit was adequately detailed and adequately sized, but unfortunately for me, when it came time to tracking it down, I put it somewhere in the shop, and at the moment, I misplaced it. So rather than trying to dig it out and try to find it, it was easier for me just to fabricate a new one. The, the new bracket is fabricated out of a strip of aluminum and is bent to the appropriate shape for the smoke grenade launcher pattern. The unit as you can see here, I went ahead and drilled a hole in and added a countersunk, and this is how it's going to be affixed to the roof of the turret. Now, it's very important that these pieces are mounted on solidly because of the of their location, specifically since the roof of the turret can come on and off. These do need to be very robust. Now, this set that we have here is assembled and ready for installation. I already assembled and mounted the other unit to the model. Let's go ahead and take a look at what the model looks like now that these sets have been fitted. And here's the smoke grenade launcher now mounted to the side of the turret. All of the details, like I mentioned before, are utilized and the bracket itself is connected to the tank's roof and the smoke grenades lift up with the roof. Now this is always something that is a problematic feature on these early production Tiger 1s and to a certain extent mid-production Tiger 1s as well. With these units connected to the roof, this makes making them fit onto the model in a seamless way very tricky because they need to be welded to the side of the vehicle with its weld detailing. If this weld detailing is absent, you're just going to have a gap or just an, a sudden drop-off on this piece here, and it's a bit of an eyesore. 
on this model here, I actually have the welded section connect, permanently attached to the model, and this piece here just sits directly on top of it, giving the illusion that the piece is permanently welded on. If I move the unit, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Now, this is a mirror image on the opposite side of the vehicle as well. Now, you can see that once these units are fitted, the detailing on the Panzer Technic pieces are very nicely done. And again, if anyone has the opportunity to acquire one of these sets, I strongly recommend it. If whether or not they're still in production or not, regardless if you have an opportunity to snag one for your build, you can definitely do no wrong. And on the top section here, this is the bracket and it is attached to the roof via a fastener. Now the fastener is a countersuck unit and I went ahead and thoroughly blended it into the surface of the strap, making it for a seamless appearance. Sculpted weld beads were added, of course, and the power cord hole was also added to the model so you can see how the power cord for these units enter into the roof of the turret. Again, it's a mirror image on the opposite side of the model. And here we have the hatches now mounted to the model. Let me go ahead and bring the camera around so you get to see exactly how the pieces were fitted on. Starting with the loader hatch, this is now permanently affixed to the roof of the model via both adhesives and fasteners. For the fasteners, I recycled several of the kit supplied units for securing the kit hatch to the top of the roof. The replacement hatch functions absolutely flawlessly and has all of its nice interior detailing that we have here. Now, if you notice, no welds are added to the section over here where the base of the hatch mates with the roof. This is, again, as per the real unit. On the real Tiger One, this component is actually bolted to the roof in a very similar way as it is on the ArmorTech kit. So if you're building one of these Tiger Ones and you're adding welds, do not add the welds to these sections over here. From the loader's hatch brings us to the main commander's cupola. The unit here is obviously fully completed and is fully functional. Here you can see the interior detailing that I was mentioning before with the periscopes and the headrests. And here you can see the interior weathering found on the hatch itself. With the hatch closed, we can now focus on this area here of the hatch hinge detailing. Now, like I said before, the components here are basically the stock armor tech units and were mostly recycled. However, I went ahead and added two little sections of coil spring on either end of the hinge. The purpose for that is that on the real Tiger One, the early Commander's Cupola had external springs and the hatch was spring assisted, undoubtedly due to the heavy armor plate of the hatch itself. Now, on the Tiger One, the this was done with a coil spring and then the one portion of the spring would lock into the hinge and then we would have another section which would come around and connect to this little fastener which would have been located on the actual hinge leg itself. This is a mirror image on the opposite side and these details were added. The springs are there just for looks, they don't really function whatsoever. And the little wire here is just, again, fabricated from pieces of floor wire. However, once it's mounted to the model, it does greatly improve the look of the piece compared to leaving it with the rod totally left exposed. Some other details to point out on the cupola hatch is this little latch that we have here. This latch here is what would hold the hatch in its open position and is what would connect to this large lug that is iconically found on the early production Tiger One Commander's Cupola. This piece here is part of the ECA set, which again, this hatch here is lifted from. Also, you'll notice several other fastener and other bits of detailing found on the Commander's Cupola hatch. Every little piece on here actually serves a function on the real unit. These round welded lugs that we have here are what hold up the inner latches that are found on the interior portion of the hatch and these three fasteners are what mount the headrest to the inside portion of the hatch as well. Finally on this side here you'll notice a small little hole in this little cylindrical object. This is actually a key lock. The Tiger One was very unique in that it actually used a key to lock the tank up when the crew is not in it to prevent anyone from basically hijacking your your vehicle. This is also by the way found on the loader's hatch as well and it's in between the 
lifting handle that is found on the loader's hatch. In addition to that, there's another little lug that we have here, and I believe on the real Tiger One, this is for use of a padlock, where in addition to the key, you can actually just put a padlock on this section, and it'll prevent the hatch from being opened. Finally, some other details to point out are these two little lugs found on either ends here of the cupola. These are actually for a retractable awning, which would be mounted in this section here and give the tank commander a little bit of shade and prevent it from getting sunburn when the vehicle is sitting in the sun. Now, unlike the loader hatch, which is bolted to the turret roof, with the commander's cupola, this is actually permanently fixed via welds. The welds were all sculpted onto this model here, and were sculpted not only on the cupola, like you see, but also along the perimeter where the roof makes contact with the side of the hull. Now, these welds are sculpted in a way where they're actually attached to the roof, so when you need to get access into the tank, when you lift up the the roof, the welds are connected to it and lift up with it. And now that the turret is fully completed, I can now mount it back onto the tank's hull. As you can see, the tank is basically ready for painting. However, before I could go ahead and go through the painting process, I'm currently waiting on the radio and the sound system to be configured. Those are currently overseas and are being configured by an associate of mine. As soon as I get the radio and the sound system back, I can mount them into the tank permanently take it for one final pre-paint test drive, and get this guy into painting and completion. Of course, more information on that is to come in the next video update. And with that, that wraps up this project update video for this 1.6 scale Armortech early production German Tiger 1. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel, which is a great way to keep in the loop of new posted content, whether it's project update videos like this one here, or the smaller scale model showcase videos, which frequently get posted on this channel. Another way to keep up to date with new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have pictures of this particular build that have been posted since the project start, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that are found on the ECA channel. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching.